from verse 10 and 11 uh, and, and kind of look at them like in their original like language and stuff and, and, and see if there's anything that it might be revealed to us in this, okay? So for we're going to start uh, backwards. We're going to go backwards in this. So we're going to start with the Messiah. Messiah is the word Christos in the, in the Greek text. Christos means anointed, right? Uh, the, the word Messiah is actually a transliteration of a Hebrew word that carries the same meaning. It means the anointed one. So when Matthew writes he is the Messiah, he writes he is the Christos. He is the Christ. He is the anointed one. Then you have the word for Savior, which is soter. Sa uh, savior means Savior, Redeemer, Deliverer. Okay, so this, <clears throat> in, a town, in, in the town of David, the anointed one has been born to us, and he is the one who will come to save and deliver us. Right? And this is the good news that will cause great joy for all the people. So the word for joy is the word kara, kara, uh, joy, gladness, rejoicing. The word for great is the word megas, which is large, great, big. So this is the good news that will cause big joy, that will cause large rejoicing, that will cause, cause great gladness for all the people. And then there's one more word I want to look at, and this one to me is like kind of the big one, and it's the word all. Okay, so all in the Greek text is pos, and pos means all, the whole, entire. Pos means all. So the anointed one has come to deliver us. The anointed one has come to deliver us, and this is like such good news. This should cause large rejoicing. This should cause big joy for literally all people, all the people, everyone. So maybe the question for us is like, well, so what is it that we need to be delivered from? And that's a good question. Well, you know, the immediate response would be something like, well, you know, sin and death. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. That alone should cause us great joy for, for everyone. Yeah, we're excited for that. Absolutely, thank you for that. But maybe there's like another another way to think here. Maybe there's something else that we could consider with all of this. Like if you throw that passage from Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, into this equation, this idea of Emmanuel, God with us, if you throw that into the discussion, I think it potentially brings like a whole new dimension to this thing. Okay, think about this. Just consider this. Jesus is the one who is the anointed one who came to deliver us. And Jesus is God with us. So maybe part of the thing that he came to deliver us from, like along with delivering us from sin and death, was to deliver us from the idea that there was ever separation between God and us. Like, is it possible that the anointed one, the word made flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, came to deliver us from the idea that God could ever not be with us. To deliver us from the idea that there was ever separation between God and creation. Because if we could get that, like if we could really allow those thoughts and ideas to like permeate our hearts and our minds, I really think that would bring big joy, great rejoicing, to all the people. I mean, if you think about it, isn't so much of the hurt and the pain that we experience in this life, so much of that is connected to like some form of disconnection, right? We go through a breakup, we go through a divorce. When a particular relationship is strained, when we experience the loss of a loved one, when we feel like we're alone, when we feel like we don't belong, when we carry like guilt and shame for something we've done for far too longer than we should, when we live with a constant guilt, shame, and fear that will never measure up to God's standards, this is all connected to some idea and understanding of disconnection. But if we could like embrace this idea, like really take this in, that there is no separation, wouldn't that bring big joy into your life, into your every day? And really, if you think, <coughs> oh, here we go. If you think back through everything that we've talked about over this series, like it all kinds of falls in line with this idea, doesn't it? 
Like last week, we talked about how God is love and how Jesus is the word of God and, and who, how Jesus was with God and is God, who was before creation and through whom all things have come into being. So love was before all things. Love gave birth to all things. Love showed up in human form to redeem all things, and then love will be in the end, will we'll reclaim, reclaim and restore all things. We talked about how this idea, like, love transcends, and because love transcends, God descends, and how this, there's this trajectory found within the Bible that everything is always moving down and among and within and here. Do you remember? We said that God was dwelling in creation with, with Adam and Eve. We said that God was dwelling in the sanctuary among the people. We saw that God was dwelling in the temple among the people. We saw that God was dwelling among us as a human in Jesus. We saw that now we are the temple, and so God is dwelling in our midst. And then we saw that in the end, God will dwell in the restored creation with creation. It's like there's this idea that we need to wake up to the reality of love that we are already living in. Then if you back up two weeks when we talked about peace, we looked at like it's through this messy lineage of Jesus, it's through this messy story of Joseph and Mary, it's during this messy time in Israel's history that Christ is revealed. It's through this mess that love becomes human. So there's this idea that we need to wake up to the idea that God is with us through everything, through the good, through the bad, through the order, through the chaos, it's always there. Or if you go all the way back to week one, we talked about hope, and we talked about the everywhereness of God, and we ran through this whole long list of verses that support this idea. Let me give you just a couple to refresh your memory. Psalms 139, where can I flee from your spirit? Where can I, what, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Acts chapter 17, for in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Colossians 1, 15, the son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So there's this idea here that we need to wake up to the reality of the presence of God that we are saturated in. We need to wake up to the idea that there is nowhere that God isn't. So when you take all of these things we've been talking about and you line them up and you put them together, it's like underneath all of it, it's like there's really only one message here. And that message seems to be that there is no separation between God and creation. Like that's, that's the message, but we struggle with this, don't we? We struggle with this, and so we have to keep hearing it over and over and over again in different forms and different ways. We have to keep saying it to ourselves over and over and over again until we come to the place that we are undefended enough to actually believe it. You know, I think Paul actually speaks to this. I think Paul believes this. Look at what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. For I am convinced, I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the presence nor the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul says nothing can separate you. Nothing can separate you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. This seems to be the theme that we keep uncovering that's running through the heart of the scripture. There is no separation between God and creation. So when we say the anointed one has been born to us, the anointed one has come to deliver us, and the one who has come to deliver us is Emmanuel, God with us, Maybe part of what he's delivering us from is this idea that there could have ever been separation. To wake up to this idea that there is no separation between God and creation, and to have this tangible expression of connection, of spirit being joined with matter in, 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 the, in the birth of the Christ child, reveals to us the thing that has been there all along. It reveals to us the truth underneath 
everything. There is no separation. And that should cause big joy for all the people. The incarnation reveals connection. The incarnation reveals a lack of separation. So because this is something that maybe we all struggle with, because this is something we need to hear over and over again, because this is something we need to say and remind ourselves until we are undefended enough to believe it, maybe we can illustrate this a, a different way. And you're in luck, I, I have such an illustration. <clears throat> All right. Can you see it says joy on this bag? You see it? There you go. That was a lucky happenstance or a divine thing. So let's say... start with this. So, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We know that Father and Son are one, right? the Word that is the Word made flesh. Father and Son are one, and we know ultimately that God is love. Does that look all right? There we go. God is love. Very good. All right, now, uh, so in the beginning, love began to create all things. Through love, all things have come, which is to say that essentially, like, love is the, like, origin of existence. You know, interestingly enough, what is it, the first law of thermodynamics that says energy cannot be created or destroyed can only be transferred or transformed, right? Like, it's kind of the same story as creation, isn't it? So let's say that this, this pile here, let's go back to this, uh, represents like the energy that was before all things, the love that was before all things, the God <coughs> who is love, who created all things and brought all things into existence. And let's say that this represents like everything that is from like the smallest grain of sand to like the very far edges of the universe. Well, what is it that we know of this divine being who is love? This divine being who is love who brought all things into existence. Well, based on our understanding of who God is and what God is like, we believe that God is one, but God is also like three. And so we have this, what we call the Trinity, right? That's a nice Trinity. So there's Father, Son, Spirit. There is this divine relationship of love through which all things have come into being. Interestingly enough, um, how we describe God is very similar to how we describe like uh, an atom, which is like the thing that is the building blocks of all of life. You know, it's like maybe not the exact same, but it's one thing that has three components, protons, neutrons, and electrons. I find that fascinating. So. In the beginning, this divine relationship of love, who is three and one, decides to create. And God says, like, let there be, let there be, let there be. And then this is where you're going to have to really start to use your imagination. Um, this, is a, this is a mountain. It's hard to see from that angle, isn't it? This is a mountain. That's a mountain. Um, also, just remember, this is kinetic sand, which is really hard to shape. Um, it's not like it's clay or uh, Play-Doh, so you're going to have to use your imagination. Um, also, I don't know if you know this, but fun fact, Play-Doh was actually uh, created by uh, the devil. Um, if, you have, <laughs> if you have kids, you know this. If you have kids, you know this. So God said, let there be, let there be, and there was mountains, and then these, these are trees. Can we go? These are trees. You can, See, it's hard to see them. And then, then God said, like, hey, uh, let's make some ocean. So these are some, these are some waves. we will not spend too much time. You can't tell anyways. So <clears throat> this divine being who is love creates all that is. And then he gets done creating, like, everything that's in the universe. And then love, because of what love does, like, love creates and love shares and love wants to share of itself. And so this divine three-in-one being says, uh, let's create something 
like in our image, something in our image that we can share our love with. So God takes like the dust of the earth and begins to shape and mold it and then breathes into it the very breath of life and God makes human beings. And so God says to creation, like, um, creation, your job is to like uh, expand and to grow and reproduce and to keep going out. And then God says to humans, like, hey, humans, um, your job is to like take care of everything as it continues to grow and expand and move out. So this is an interesting relationship, the human creation dynamic. First of all, the whole thing was meant to work together. Like our entire existence is contingent upon one another, right? So we need the plants and animals and and everything that's in it because like that's how we eat and that's how we like build and create and that's how we we breathe. It's a really important relationship that God has established for all of us to have. And then the other thing about it is that like ultimately um, we're all kind. It, it's all kind of like the same stuff, right? And so um, when you start to look at like the physical composition of humanity, what you actually see is that um, we're only really comprised of like four major elements. There's um, like hydrogen and oxygen and carbon and nitrogen. Um, that's what makes all of us up. But then what science has discovered is they've continued to explore like the vastness of the universe is like all the planets and stars and galaxies and stuff, they're made of like the same kind of basic thing, which is hydrogen and oxygen and carbon and nitrogen. And so whether you're talking about like our innermost being or whether you're talking about like stars on the far edges of the galaxy, far edges of the universe, it's all kind of the same basic material. So essentially you were made of the stuff of stars, which is kind of a cool thought. Or as like, uh, who is it, Neil deGrasse Tyson, he talks about how, um, you know, what's, what's really beautiful about life in general, what's cool about the fact that we exist is not just that we are alive and existing in the universe, but because we're made of the same basic stuff, like what's fascinating about humanity is that the universe exists in us as well. It's kind of cool. So when you start to think in these kind of maybe slightly different terms and start to expand some of our understanding of a few different things, and then all of a sudden, if you go back and you start to think about these verses that we've been talking about over the past couple of weeks and even re-mentioned today, like these may take on a bit of a new light. These may take on begin to carry a bit more weight, right? Think about it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Through Him, all things were created. Uh, in Him, we live and we move and we have our being. In Him, all things hold together. It's like life and all of existence it's like all a part of this divine kind of milieu, if you will, right? So all the wide variety of plants and animals and people that we have, it's all just various expressions of the divine love that was at the beginning through whom all things have come. You see, the problem is, <clears throat> at least I think, for a wide variety of reasons, all kinds of different reasons and ideas, is that I think we have bought into a lie called separation, right? So let's say this is you, this is, this is us, this is we, there we go, this is us. We bought into this lie that we could ever be separate from God, separate from creation. We bought, we've bought into the lie that separation from the divine is even possible. And so even though it's not true, like we live with this idea that we could be alone or that, that, that we could be separate. And I, and I think this is where so much of our hurt 
and pain comes from. Well, nobody could ever love me. Well, I'm not good enough. Or I have to somehow earn and prove something to somebody to have some sort of value. Or I never really feel connected to God. Or has God abandoned me? Or I have to do all the right things in all the right ways in order to have some sort of experience, to to experience God's love. Which, of course, like the irony of the whole thing is like what the scripture actually tells us. That in him you live and move and have your being. That the irony is Paul tells us nothing can separate us from the love of God. The irony, of course, in all this is that uh, even if we leave with this perce- live with this perceived concept of separation, uh, if you get down to it, I mean, even the stuff that we're made of is like the same stuff as, as everything else. Like, so the fact to me The fact that we exist suggests that there is connection. The fact that we exist speaks to the reality that there is no separation. You see, you, us, we, we were created for union. We were created out of union. We were created in the image and likeness of union. Because love was before all things and brought all things into existence. We were created for union. And so if we buy into this lie that we could ever somehow be separated from the divine that has brought all things into existence, that in him we live and move and have our being, that holds all things together, if we buy into that, it's like, it's like we're standing in opposition to what God actually created. We're standing in opposition to ultimate reality. It's like this whole thing is really just one message, and that is there has never been separation, and there never will be Separation. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. The good news that should cause great joy for all the people is that the anointed one has come to deliver you from the illusion of separation. What's even more incredible, I don't know if it's more incredible, it's also incredible, because that was pretty incredible. I don't know if you guys got it, but it was pretty incredible. Uh, was that like when you start to see this and you begin to understand this, this is when life, I think, really opens up. This is like where the good stuff starts to happen. Like what you'll see is like it's all, it's all, the whole thing is, is a teacher. The whole thing is like this school and it's a giant school that's meant to like reveal to us the love that was before all things. It's this giant school that's meant to reveal to us that you are a child of the divine. You are a child. You are the sons and daughters of God. And like, you already belong. You don't have to prove. You don't have to earn. Like, you can be free to create, to play, to, 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 to enjoy the life that you've been given. Right? The whole thing is imbued with meaning when you understand it this way. It's only when we buy into the lie and forget it. It's only when we forget that we are connected that life kind of becomes meaningless. You see, the beauty of Christmas is that the birth of Jesus the birth of Emmanuel, God with us, the anointed one, has revealed to us the love that was before all things. The anointed one has come to deliver us from the idea that we could ever not be connected. The anointed one 
has come to deliver us from the lie of separation. The Anointed One reveals to us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Because in Him we live and we move and we have our being. He holds all things together. And when you can understand that, like when it sinks in, it really should be good news that is great joy for all the people. There's really only one message to this whole thing, that there is no separation. You already belong. We are going to go ahead and move into our time of communion. We're going to reflect on, on our connection, our relationship with, with God, with the one in whom we rest, we find our joy. We always have a relationship to grow there. And during the first week, we talked about hope. We talked about waking up to the idea that God is here among us already. Then we talked about peace. We talked about waking up to and recognizing the, the divine in all of us, the divine in humanity, in ourselves, in our neighbors, even in those that we don't always get along with, God is here. And we talked about love during the season where we focus on the birth of Christ. We talked about how the incarnation is God saying, I love you. I want to be closer with you. I want to know you more and I want you to know me more. Today we are talking about joy but remembering that there is no separation between ourselves and God. That God is always with us. We get to spread this joy to others by being present with them as well. Maybe one of the things for us to wake up to during this Advent season is a focus that we get to be with the people that are in our lives. Those in this room who are present here. And with the wonderful invention of technology, those of you watching online, you are present here as well. We get to be present with each other in a vast array of different ways. And sometimes we, we take that for granted. Sometimes we're with people and we're off somewhere else. And although we're together, there, there's some type of, of separation there. So maybe we, we wake up to the joy that's here by remembering how to bring closeness with those that are right next to us. We're going to pray, and then I'll direct us into a time of communion, if you'll bow with me. Lord, our Creator, you have showed your love for us by being with us. Lord, help us find and tap into the joy of having a relationship with you. Because, Lord, you seek to bring fullness of life to all of us. In this season, we, we remember you stepping into the world to walk with us. You have left your spirit with us so that each of us are always connected with you. Lord, help us, help remind us how to stay connected to others, how to stay connected to our neighbors, to the ones beside us. Lord, we pray this in the name 
of your Son, and in the fellowship of your Spirit. Amen. There is communion at your tables. Say a, uh, in just a moment a prayer. Uh, have someone at your table say a prayer over it. Uh, as we take communion together, as we bring our closeness with God and our closeness with each other in mind. If you are watching online, take whatever elements you have and join us in this moment. If there will be someone at the prayer wall and at the cross, if you need someone to pray with during this time, you can go to them. And if you're watching online, you can type in the chat and someone will be there to pray for you as well. But you enjoy this time of communion as you celebrate the connectedness with God and one another.